The peace of God be always with you. Please be seated. So I happen to love a gospel reading that starts with such honesty, that says there were so many people in the house we couldn't even eat. I'm like, yes, that's a writer after my own heart. Tell it like it is. Is that an important part? It's in the gospel. It starts that way. Why is it there? I think it's there because it is important. It is important for us to understand that when Jesus went somewhere, people crowded around him. They wanted to be near him. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to be healed by him. They were so crowded into this space that they couldn't even take time to get something to eat. And Jesus loved them. And then it tells us that the town gossips ran off to Mary and said, hey, honey, you better go get your boy. He's lost his mind. She's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Let me go down there. So here comes Mary and her family, right? And also, here are the scribes, the legal experts, they, those who know everything. I think they know everything. So they start saying, this guy here, he's possessed by Beelzebul, or as we like to say, Satan, the church lady. Satan. Jesus was like, that's not, that's ridiculous. If I'm possessed by Satan, why would I be doing things that are getting rid of Satan? Satan, ha, Satan, the accuser. Jesus was talking to people and telling them these things, these thoughts that were in their minds about they were not worthy were not true. These thoughts that they were not loved were not true. He was casting out the demon of self-doubt. He was casting out demons of depression. He was casting out all that was not love within the people that were gathered there around him. Then his mothers and brothers said, you, somebody go get him. He needs to come home. Bring him. Get him. Get him out of there. We need to take him home. We need to make sure that he's safe. We don't want the whole town talking about us. It's going to look bad. We want to look normal. <laughs> I love that word. Just the setting on the washing machine. We want to look like everybody else does. We, want, we don't want to be considered odd. Did we just hear that in the reading from Isaiah? Jewish people are like, we need a king. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. We don't want just a judge. We want a king. We have this fear that we are going to look different, that people are going to perceive us as different. Well, I'm going to tell you, people, if we are following Jesus, not just worshiping Jesus, but actually following Jesus, like when we were kids and you play follow the leader, you do this behind the person who's doing that. If we are following Jesus, we are going to look weird because we are going to love radically and unconditionally. And that's not normal. Normal likes to separate. We like to say, you people belong over here and you people belong over here and this is what is right and this is what is wrong and we know how it gets divided. And Jesus says, no, no. No. Jesus says we have to do God's will. What does that even mean? How do we do God's will? How do we know what God's will is? That's a toughie. So I'm, most of you know that I am in recovery, drugs and alcohol. And in the 12 steps, the 11th step talks about praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Praying for knowledge of God's will. Please, God, I want to do your will. How do I know? Well, first of all, I know that if it is focused and centered in love, then it comes from God. If I'm acting out of fear, whether my fear is for me or for you, I don't believe that I'm doing God's will. If I am telling you that what you're doing is wrong and you're going to go to hell because of who you are, I'm acting out of fear. And I'm not acting out of love. Unconditional love means I love you. Jesus sat there with all of these people crowding around him. People who were outcasts, people who didn't fit in. 
people who were shunned by the town, people that maybe hadn't washed in a while, people that maybe talked to themselves. Jesus didn't care. Jesus knew that it is love that casts out fear. And when we do God's will, we are acting in love. Do I always know that? Do I always know that I'm doing God's will? No. But I hope and I believe that even if I'm not doing it exactly right, which you saw me do the welcome so you know I don't get things right, then God is still going to make it okay. Hopefully you still felt welcomed. And there is a prayer. There's a prayer by Thomas Merton. It was a Trappist monk. And I'm going to read it to you. I don't normally read, but I'm going to read this to you. Because when I found this prayer, it really made me understand about doing God's will. And you think, right, a monk prays daily, regularly, all the time, sitting in silence, reading the Bible, doing all the godly things that obviously he knows what God's will is. Well, listen to this. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. I don't know if I'm doing God's will. And honestly, I'm a little wary of people who are very certain that they know they are doing God's will. I know what my will looks like. I know how to force people to do what I want them to do. And I don't think that's God's will. I think God's will is kindness. I think God's will is love. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. When we're acting through love, God makes it all right in the end. Amen.